This is The Other Side of Midnight. I'm Frank Morano. I've said repeatedly that one of the greatest things about working in radio is that you so often get to meet and talk to folks that you've looked up to, folks that you've seen on television, seen in the movies, read their books, listened to on radio. But one of the magical things about working at this network and being on WABC in New York and all the other great stations that we're on around the country is that you actually get the opportunity to work with and and refer to as a colleague people that you have admired and looked up to. And that certainly fits the bill with our next guest. Ernie Anastas has led a storied career and is leading, I don't want to refer to him in the past (laughs) tense, is leading a storied career in broadcast journalism. He is an Emmy Award winning TV news anchor, a Hall of Fame broadcast journalist. He's currently hosting Positively Ernie on 77 WABC in New York and uh, doing a syndicated television feature called Positively America, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Ernie, it is great to see Frank, you. you're knocking me out here. What an intro. Uh, I am Man. I am blown away. I'm floored. I've gotten to interview you a bunch oh, of times boy. before, but yeah. this is the first time we've been in studio. It's great to have this you. This is fantastic. I mean, we're both, you know, on WABC, love the station, love the people here. You know, the important thing, too, and you and I just talked about it before sure. we went on, there's a great spirit here. And I think people who are working anywhere in any company, if you have a good attitude, a good positive feeling where you walk into a studio or to your office, doesn't that feel great? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and, you know, there are two things that I think everybody that meets you has to ask you about. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get to one in a moment. Okay. But the first is, and I don't want to sound patronizing, Here we go. Here we go. but you have been on television mm-hmm. for half a century. Yeah, okay. Sure. You look incredible. You look the same oh, as when you, I watched you growing up. What is the key? Uh, to is, mm. it, is it exercise? Is it diet? Is it a good plastic surgeon? Is no. it some combination? No. I, I, you know what? Honestly, I think the, the, the answer to your question is attitude. First of all, I grew up in a very positive home. Uh, grandfather was a Greek Orthodox priest back in New Hampshire. Uh, we always had a good spirit in our home and uh, good genes. You know, my, my parents have lived, you know, a good life in the 90s. And I think that's important to have genes, but uh, good genes. But if you also have a good spirit, a good attitude, and I've always felt happy inside. And I think you can see that. It's a natural thing. And I think part of that is spirituality. I just think that I, I, I love people and I love life. And I have on my telephone, as soon as I open up my telephone, I'm going to show it to you right now. Here we go. Uh, hold on. Let me turn this off. Put it back on. Okay. You see that? It's the globe. Right. Okay. This is a NASA picture. And I look at this thing every day and I say to myself, Ernie, you are living on this planet. It's not on your teacher's desk, you know, a globe on a stand when you were in fifth grade. This is the real McCoy. And I always try to think of myself like right now you and I are talking and I'm saying I'm on the globe. I'm living here. So I think about creation. I think about the beauty of life and all of the things that have been made for us to enjoy. And I'm saying, this is great. This is a gift to me. And I want to give that gift back. It's so funny. When I spoke with William Shatner, he Mm. talked about how seeing the Earth from space changed his perspective to some extent on uh, where you fall in, uh, in the place of uh, the global civilization and the Mm -hmm. global village and that whole thing. You've been such a staple in broadcast journalism for so long. For for a lot of people, especially New Yorkers, yes. it's almost like you came with the television. They don't ever <laughs> remember a time where you weren't on television oh, or on radio. Wow. One of the things I think people may not fully understand the story of is how you got your start mm-hmm. in journalism. I know you didn't start in New York, no. but you are so identified with New York TV yes. stations, Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 7. Mm-hmm. How did you break in in New York, especially? Well, well I'll tell you a quick story. When I was a kid... Uh, Uh, Like about 10 years old, 11 years old, I used to sit underneath the kitchen table uh, back in New Hampshire, back in Nashua. And I would take the the, uh, the radio and I would listen to it. And when the announcer would talk, I would turn it down and then I would talk. And then when the music came up, then I turned the music (laughs) on. And I was doing that when I was 10, 11 years old. Finally, at 13, I went downstairs in the basement and I built a little station. Uh, I got some two-by-fours, I got some sheets, whatever it was, and I got a couple of turntables and a microphone, and I built a little radio station, got the wires and put them upstairs into the kitchen, and my mom would be cooking and listening to me. But I had all my buddies come over, and we did radio shows. So I loved it from the time I was like 13 years old. At 16, I went to the local radio station, WOTW, 
And I walked in the door, and I met the program director, Dick Corbin. And I said, Mr. Corbin, um, could I sweep the floors, put the records away, <laughs> and stuff like that? And he said, you know, you have a pretty good voice. He said, why don't you sit down? I sat down in front of a microphone. You know the way I can hear myself now in these earphones? Sure. You know, That was the first time that I really heard myself wow. for real. And I said, oh, my God, this is incredible. And I loved it. So I got a job. He said to me, I want you to do a talk show for teenagers. And I was 16 years old, Saturday morning discussion. And that was the beginning. And I started at 16, went to college in Boston, Northeastern University, was on the air uh, at 16, haven't been off. I've worked all these years in radio, television. So here's how I got to New York. Okay, I'm in radio, and I'm working at WRKO in Boston. Oh, sure. Great station. Absolutely. I was doing morning news, and I'm working at WRKO, having a wonderful time. And they said, Ernie, uh, what else do you want to do? And I said, you know, I can do a little television. So I went downstairs. It was owned by RKO General. And I went downstairs, and I did a little TV work at Channel 7. And then they had a TV opening, or I should say a radio opening in Chicago at the Great Chicago Fire, WFYR. So I went out there. And while I was in, Bo- uh, in Chicago, I went to a television station and did a little work at WLS, and I got the bug. And I said, i got to do television. This is really important. But here's a cute story. This is a cute story. When I was working in Boston, and you'll, you'll understand this, um, Ernie Anastas, uh, back in 1968, 69, uh, it was not cool. Too and, ethnic? Yeah, it was. At that time, you know, all the DJs, this was the number one station, 50,000 right. power watt station. And it was cool, you know, to be J.J. Jeffrey, Bobby Mitchell, you know, these guys. So my news director said, Ernie, would you like to be Ernie Andrews for a while? And I said, Ernie Andrews? He said, yeah. He said, you know, he said, it's going to sound nice on the air. He said, we're a big station. So I called my dad. I said, Dad, what do you think? He said, no. He said, it's your career. He said, just do it. So I went on the air and I used the name Ernie Andrews. And uh, I, you know, I did that for several years. And then finally, I was going to work in television. And I went to Providence, Rhode Island, WPRI-TV. And the news director hired me, and the general manager brought me in, and we sat down. And he said, Ernie, you know, he said, I've been thinking about your name. I said, oh, this is great, because I decided I'm going to go back to my real name. And he said to me, yeah, he said, I've been thinking about your name. He said, Ernie, Ernie Andrews. I said, right. He said, how do you feel about Keith Andrews? (laughs) (laughs) I almost fell off the floor. I said, Keith Andrews? I said, Mr. Pfeiffer, I said, you know, this is too funny. I said, I, I've been thinking about my name. I said, but I want to go back and use my own name, Ernie Anastas. And he said, you're doing it. He said, I think that's great. He said, let's do it. And that was the beginning. It, clearly, it, it has worked. Uh, you have more Emmys than most people have uh, neckties, yeah. right? And you've had the kind of uh, incredible career in journalism in New York that most people can only dream of. M- almost all of it, though, as a TV anchor mm-hmm. anyway, has been on local TV stations. Yes. Now, I am sure the ratings that you got on Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel mm-hmm. 7 over the years— there must have been all sorts of offers for you to uh, be a national TV anchor, mm-hmm. but you always chose to to stay local. I'm yeah. curious. You've done a lot of things nationally, sure. including what you're doing now, Positively America. Yep. But why did you make that decision to stay on local TV news? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I'm in Providence, Rhode Island, and then I get this offer to come to New York. And I'm at Channel 7, WABC-TV. And I'm, I'm really loving it. I mean, the people there are terrific, and I'm enjoying myself. And while I was there, I was asked to substitute on Good Morning America mm. with Joan London. So Joan and I would do it off and on, and I was having a good time. And there was interest, you know, for me to do more at GMA and at ABC. But I was doing so well at WABC Channel 7 in New York. They were very pleased with me, and I was happy there. And they said, Ernie, you know, we want you to make that choice. And I did. And I stayed at Channel 7 because I thought it was good. But I was doing some, you know, part-time work, if you will. Same thing happened at CBS. Uh, While I was anchoring at Channel 2, I did CBS this morning, substituted many times. And I enjoyed that. But I really liked liked the contact. Mm -hmm. I liked the, the, the communion that I had with the people in New York. And this is a great city. And I love this city. I can go anywhere, walk down the street, in any neighborhood, and someone will yell out, Ernie! Uh, oh, I don't doubt it. it and it, I love that. You know, it's personal. And, and that leads me to the next of the two questions that sure. I alluded to that everybody is curious about. One was, of course, how do you look the same? Most people think you have a Dorian Gray-style portrait <laughs> in, in your attic somewhere. No. The other has to do with the attitude that you described, yes. the relentless positivity. Now, local journalism, local TV news 
especially, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has so often been defined by covering crime. And one of the criticisms of it has been True. that it's been a, a police blotter. Mm-hmm. And yet you, both on air yeah. and off air, mm-hmm. you seem so incredibly positive. And yeah. unlike some people that may try to put on a front that they're positive and then they're screaming at people behind mm-hmm. the scenes, I can tell that you know it's not an act with you. Sure. What is the key to that attitude, to staying positive when the stories you're covering are tough, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's September 11th, whether it's blackouts, whether it's uh, the assassination of John Lennon, yeah. and staying positive in your personal life when you're in a business where there's, it seems like at, at times there's a viper's nest around you. Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting combination because, you know, uh, when I'm on the air, I've been on the air for many years reporting some horrible stories, painful stories. I mean, 9-11 and, and, and so many others. Um, you feel something. You have to feel mm. something. But at the same time, I remember when I was going to college, I didn't study journalism. I studied social, uh, sociology and anthropology. And the reason for that was because I felt human behavior, okay, sociology is what the news is about. These are real people. They're not numbers. They're not statistics. These are human beings. These are real individuals that I'm talking about. And that has always kept me anchored. I've always been thinking about the people that are involved in these stories. And because of that spirituality that I talked about, there's empathy. There's a care that I have, and there's a feeling that we're all in this together. And having a good home life is very important. Mm. So if you have a good home life, if you feel solid in what you're doing, if you believe in your family, if you believe in something that's higher, you know, better than, than, than what we have on this earth, I think that keeps you in a positive spirit. Um, one of the nicest compliments that was paid to me Someone that I really admired, uh, she came over to me one day and she said, Ernie, here's how I feel about you doing the news. And I said, what is it? She said, if I have to hear bad news, I want to hear it from you. And I thought about that. And I said, you know what? That's my job. That's my mission. I'm a conduit. And I always wanted to make sure while I was on the air that I was sensitive to the stories, that when we had an opportunity to smile and have a little fun, I would do that. But when it was a serious story, I wanted to make sure that they understood that I felt something. I I, I think, you know, Maya Angelou said it well. People may not remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm. And it's all about feelings. Look, you and I right now, we're in the studio, right? There's a feeling going on Absolutely. here. We're having a good time. I, by the way, I, I'm thrilled. When I invited you on the program, I never uh, in dreamed that you'd be up for uh, coming in studio of at course, night like for this. You. <laughs> I, I'm really pleased and, and honored, quite frankly, that, you, that you've done so. Uh, we're talking with Ernie Anastas. If you haven't heard him yet with these uh, short-form Er, uh, positively Ernie commentaries. You can check them out on wabcradio.com. They're really terrific. We're going to talk about that in a minute. You've also, uh, I, don't, I don't think experimented is the right word, but you have delved into the world of media ownership, mm-hmm. owning some radio stations yeah. uh, in New York and elsewhere. What is that like when you're used to creating the content and working for other people? How did you find the difference in attitude and approaching things differently as an owner of a media outlet? Okay. Uh, Owning a radio station was a dream. When I talked about being a little boy back in New Hampshire and building that little station in the basement, that was a dream. I kept saying, wouldn't it be nice to have a radio station of my own? And, and that dream, you know, stayed with me. So being in New York, being on the air, I had an opportunity to be able to go out and look for a station, and, and the management agreed to said it was okay. It was a non-compete. It was certainly small little radio stations in different markets, Saratoga, New York, and Massachusetts, and uh, Albany area. So I went up there, and I started looking at stations. The fun thing about that is that when you start planning what you're doing, the formats, you're like a kid again. Right, I can imagine. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a great line, when I grow up, I want to be another kid. <laughs> okay, and that was the feeling. I said, oh my goodness, I'm playing with this thing all over again. So I changed call letters. I ended up creating the format, Star Radio and so forth, picked the music. I just loved doing it. And to me, it was wonderful. And the other thing that was fun was going into the community and doing a lot of the things that I did in the early days of broadcasting. Ideas that were given to me by other people uh, with programming, being involved in the community, having events, charity events, and so forth. And I created that spirit. And as a result, I had some success. And I had fun working with the people, motivating them and getting the feedback from them. I tell you something. Here's one story. That radio station that I mentioned, WOTW in Mm -hmm. Nashua, it came up for sale. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, oh, man, this is the station that I started at. And I bought it. Oh, wow. I mean, full circle, 
full circle. So I owned that station for a while. The uh, the former governor of uh, New Jer- of New Hampshire rather bought the station, and that was a kind of a nice thing. It was a transitional period, but I, that was so much fun for me. And ownership to me um, really gave me an opportunity to to explore more of the talent and to work with people, and I encourage a lot of people who've gone on to other jobs. The world of radio, a little bit different from the world of television, and you've also had some success in the world of print. Mm. You're actually uh, not only used to telling the news to adults, but to children as well. You've been a pretty successful children's book author. What makes you decide when you're, it doesn't sound like you're lacking for things to do, yeah. uh, radio, running radio stations, owning radio stations, uh, doing multiple newscasts every day on television, mm-hmm. doing all these special programs that you've done over the years. Why write a children's book? What prompted that? Well, there were two books. Uh, back in 1983, I did a, a book called uh, Twixt, Teens Yesterday mm-hmm. and Today. Now, you'll remember I told you about that first talk show that I did, Saturday morning discussion. It was with young people, teenagers. I would interview young people at different high schools, talk about social issues, play the top 10 songs. So I always had an interest in youth. So in 1983, I wrote a book about the history of teenagers in America, Uh, and it was fabulous from the roaring 20s all the way up into the 80s, and I had a great time doing that, and I treated it like a television show because I had little quotes and Mm. comments from people that I interviewed from different generations, and then I had a narration, and I had a whole bunch of photographs showing what it was like being a teenager in all these different decades. So that went on to the next thing, and I said, I want to do a children's book. Ernie and the Big News, The Adventures of a TV Reporter. And I had fun writing that story. And it was all about me. And if you look at the book, it's a little kid who's got a little radio station in the basement with his friends. And then he gets the big job in New York City, and he's covering all the news. So it's my story in in book form. And we tied in with the St. Francis Food Pantries Mm. and Shelters in New York. And we gave away uh, close to 20,000 books. I would go out to different schools throughout the area, and I would go into the auditorium speaking to 400 kids at a time and just, you know, telling them about why it's important for them uh, to make the world a better place. You know, what career do you want to have? I talked about my career, and I tell them a quick story. And I said, you know what? When I was about 14 years old, we had a career day, and everybody came in talking about different kinds of jobs. And I went to my school teacher there, uh, Miss Evelyn Ryan, And I said, Miss Ryan, how do you know what to do with your career? How do you know how to choose the right career? And she looked at me, and she used to call me Ernest. She said, Ernest, whatever you enjoy doing will be the avenue to your success. Mm. And I'm 14 years old. I said, what does that mean? She said, what do you like to do in your spare time when you don't have to do anything? I said, I got a radio station in the basement. She said, that's it. So I told the kids that story, and you know what? They light up. They start raising their hands. I like, you know, goldfish. Maybe I'll be, you know, going to oceanography or something. It's fantastic. That I is terrific. That. I love it. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, St. Francis Food Pantry. Our friend Joe Sano is always praising oh, yeah. the great work that you've done in terms of raising money for great some uh, very ne- needy people with St. Francis Food Pantry. Talk to me about Positively Ernie. Your WABC airs every morning uh, and in the afternoon, and you can check out the podcast at WABC Radio. Radio.com. Mm-hmm. Love these short form commentaries. Sometimes it's just you giving tips on how to stay positive yep. or things you've learned about staying positive. Sometimes it's great mm-hmm. interviews you've done with people like Cousin Brucey, Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, a <laughs> yeah. number of others. Why do this at this point? What are you hoping to get out of this? What are you hoping the listeners get out of this? You've done your homework. <clears throat> well, <laughs> you, I, I listen. <laughs> I know you regularly. do. Regularly. You really do. Uh, John Katzenmatifis, okay, great friend. I've known him for 40 plus years. And we've known each other for a long time, done a lot of different things together. He and I were talking, and then it came up. And I said, John, this would be a great opportunity for for both of us to have some fun. So Positively Ernie is a spinoff from Positively America in many ways and what I was doing in New York on Fox 5. And I I decided that I would do these little mini stories, two minutes on the air, talking about perhaps a problem, like let's say bullying, uh, describing it briefly, but then what's being done to make it better? So the format basically is, okay, give me an issue, give me a problem, but how can we make it better? What improvements are being made? For years, I went on the air at 11 o'clock and saying good evening and then telling people why it wasn't. And I said, you know what? I'm going to turn that around. I'd always look for positive ways to do it. So the features are like that. So I'll do an interview with an expert about a a particular topic, find ways of how we can make life better. Then I go out on the street and Mm -hmm. I do my man on the street question. 
I'll ask somebody, does money really buy happiness? And I love doing that. And people just respond to it. I'm telling you, it's great to get their answers. And the interaction is fabulous. Then I do a little commentary. Um, I'll tell a quick story. I'll tell something that I think is important about staying positive. I had one on the air recently about the five balls. You know, in life, uh, there there was a a mentor talking to a young person and said, you know what, you're going to go through life pretty much doing the same thing that we all do. But, But let's do a visual. Consider yourself juggling the five imaginary balls in the air, and it's work, family, friends, health, and reputation. The work ball is a rubber ball. It's going to bounce. It's going to go everywhere. Don't worry about it. You'll settle down. Your career will be okay. Remember, work is a rubber ball. Family, friends, health, and your reputation, they're glass balls. You drop one. You chip it. it, You shatter it. Mm. So what are your values in life? the relationships that you have, what really is important to you, take care of that. Because a lot of people do nothing but just work. You know, there's a great line, that guy is so poor, all he has is money. And, you, <laughs> and, 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 and there's a lot of truth to that. You and I have been around. I've Absolutely. interviewed so many people. Uh, and, and if you don't have a sense of purpose in your life, and that's where it goes back. You talk about why I feel young or look young. It's purpose, because I know why I'm here. I know why I'm here. Is there ever a moment where someone cuts you off in traffic and you and you curse <laughs> even to yourself? No. It's difficult for me to <laughs> yeah. imagine seeing you just just lose it and lose Ooh, your temper. Man. You know what? I'm human. There are times, and you're right. If you're driving around New York, especially right, bus lanes, bike lanes. I mean, construction, <laughs> restaurants in the street. I mean, it's amazing. So sometimes, yeah, you know, if somebody cuts me off, but I'm always a little careful because uh, sometimes uh, if I want to yell or scream, right, you remember. Remember, you're Ernie and Astis. Well, they'll turn around and they'll say, <laughs> hi, Ernie. <laughs> uh, tell me about Positively. So if people yeah. haven't heard per- Positively yeah. Ernie yet, they can listen every morning at 945 on WABC, or you can listen whenever you want to the podcast at WABCradio.com. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that you that you do, in addition to interviewing interesting people and telling interesting stories, yeah. is there's, there's a lot of key takeaways for people. Now, right now, it's the middle of the night for a lot of people, early morning for some. Mm-hmm. Some people are listening to us, they're alone, maybe uh, they're recently retired, maybe yep. a loved one sure. died, uh, maybe they're just lonely. What's a, t- a lot of people listening have uh, written to me that they're blind or they're suffering with a disability and uh, they listen to us because they can't sleep or they're going through some sort of health issue. Sure. For somebody facing challenges, whether it's a health issue, whether it's mm-hmm. an emotional one, a, a mental one, what can you offer them as a tip on how to stay positive and how to always find that silver lining in a gray cloud you know what i'd say remember that you are loved okay you're loved by our creator that's why you're here you're loved by someone else in this life and love is what makes the world go around and there is a future for us and i don't want people to think and worry too much because fear is the absence of faith if you're worrying about something you don't have the faith to me if someone is listening to us right now and i'm saying look In the end, the final thing that you're going to be thinking about, who did I love and who loved me? And so the message I give to whoever's listening is think about love. Um, Give love. If you give love, you're going to get it back. Find a way in your own mind to relax and feel the presence of our spirit. And, you know, when you're still and you're quiet, that's why a lot of people meditate. Listen to that inner voice and hear what that inner voice is telling you. But feel the love, because to me, it's the greatest force in the world, and that's what gives you peace. My only issue with the positively or any pieces that you've been doing, and I love a lot of the people that you've spoken to, uh, Cousin Brucey, Bobby Valentine is a Met fan, oh, yeah, uh, sure. Jeffrey Gardier, yeah. m- many others, is that these uh, interviews are way too short. I, you yeah. always leave me wanting more. Is there any chance that uh, we might see you do a longer form yes. talk show on radio sometime Absolutely. soon? Absolutely. Uh, in, in a very short time, uh, we'll be on the air on the weekends. Oh, great. I'll be doing a one hour show live, and we'll have an opportunity to talk to a lot of guests for a much longer period of time on the air and it's going to be an interesting mix Uh, we're going to have some celebrities we'll have some authors we'll have some people who have a positive message and a little bit of the commentary and there's a wonderful wonderful lady her name is patricia stark and patricia has been an anchor on the fox news channel she also has uh, written a book confidence uh, a terrific person My, my wife and family and i have known her for a long time and her family so she and i are going to do it together 
and the chemistry. Oh, is that's great. terrific! Yeah, I can't really wait to have, hear that. Yeah, it's terrific, and and that's going to be on the air, and we'll be doing more of the long form of interviews. I think you're going to like that show. I'm a looking lot. forward to it. Yeah, positively, America. Yes, I haven't seen this yet. This is a syndicated TV project yep. that you're doing. Yep. Uh, what's this about, and how can people see it? Okay, uh, a qu- quick story. Uh, 2020, COVID. Right. And uh, I said, you know what, this is a tough time. Uh, we were thinking about doing the news from home and so forth. And I said, you know what, I want to take a little break here. So I took a year and I went to Harvard Business School, sat down, learned a lot about programming, leadership and so forth. And came back and I said, you know what, I'm not going to do the news. I'm going to create a program, which is basically what I'm talking about, positive stories. So I produced 26 half-hour shows, Hmm. 26 half-hour shows. And they're all with interviews, people talking about, you know, lifestyle, health, uh, careers, relationships. And so we put them together, and now we're on 180 stations around the country. TV stations. TV stations. We just picked up um, the NBC station in Seattle, KING. And uh, and it's growing, and I hope to be on the air in New York this fall. But it's a a half-hour program on weekends. And I'm having fun with it. Well, Terrific. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great show. It's a great concert. Uh, it sounds great. Now, uh, speaking of television, you came of age in New York television at a time when local news was the be-all and end-all. That's mm. well, That was appointment viewing for people, mm-hmm. whether it was 6 o'clock, whether it was uh, 10 p.m., 11 p.m., yep. 5 o'clock. And they were giants in those days, right? You had uh, <laughs> folks like Bill Butel, uh, folks Roger like Gabe, Prep- Gabe, Gabe Pressman, Gabe Roger Grimsby. Roger, yep. Other than uh, Chuck Scarborough or Marvin and Marvin Scott these days, a lot of those giants are gone, either retired or yes. moved on to the great anchor yep. desk in the sky. <laughs> Is there anybody that you worked with or competed against in mm-hmm. those days, mm-hmm. the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, that you think uh, was really special and a really unique talent in terms sure. of their ability to communicate and deliver the news? Two people that I really spent a lot of time with and admired, uh, Bill Butel. A wonderful human being. Bill was the uh, consummate professional. Uh, he was well read. Uh, he had a personality. He was warm. He was sincere. Uh, you you would have fallen in love with Bill, not only on the air but off the air. And so Bill and I really got along well, and I admired him. And 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 he and I just got along famously. The other guy that really I spent a lot of time with was Walter Cronkite. Uh, when I was at CBS, Walter was sort of a mentor. He, he did a tribute for me, and, and someday you'll have a chance to listen to it, but it was so nice, and I was just so honored by it. Walter just had a way of, of giving you the feeling that everything was good, everything was okay. He was the most trusted man in America. And I remember sitting down with Walter, and he had that fabulous voice. Hey, let me tell you a little story here now. And I said, Walter, you know, what do we do? How, how do we do this, and why is it so important? And he said, you know, he said, we're watchdogs. We're not attack dogs, and we're not lap dogs. Mm. We're watchdogs, and we bark, and we let the public out there listen to us and hear what we're saying and let them take the action. Uh, words like that, people like that, Butel, Grimsby, and so many others, and I, I, I also worked with Jim Jensen, who was also a, a master at his work. Um, these, are, these are role models. These are people that, that inspire you. And when I think about them, uh, I, I think of um, why a lot of young people should study them and find out why they were so good at what they did. You learn from the past. You've also been the recipient of many honorary doctorates over the mm-hmm. years from a whole bunch of different mm-hmm. real, really respected institutions of higher learning. Is there any way that you can get away with calling yourself doctor if you have an honorary doctorate? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I was in Boston getting an honorary degree at Northeastern University. Uh, after I graduated, and and I registered because I was getting this honorary degree. I registered as doctor. I think they registered me because they they put the room up. So it was Dr. Ernie Anastas. And uh, I'm in my room with my family, and the phone rings. And the person on the other end says, "Uh, is this Dr. Anastas? And uh, I said, yes, it is. Um, We have a problem. We have a medical issue here. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I've never used it. I'm very careful with that. You can That's see where that funny. can happen, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Oh, my God. But, no, I've, I've been very honored by all of that, and it's nice, and uh, it just makes me feel good. I, I think, I think I, I'll, I'll sort of finish with this. Irma Bombeck had a great line. She said, when I die and I face God, I'm going to say, I have no talent. I have no talent left. I used everything you gave me. Uh, that's a great note to end on. Uh, I have 
hours worth of things that I could discuss with you, and you got to come back if you're, you're willing. You're great. You're great. It's right. a real treat to have you. Ernie Anastas, uh, check him out, uh, Positively America. It is a show that is sweeping the nation quite literally, and Positively Ernie, which if you're outside of the New York area, you can listen to at wabcradio.com. Ernie, we'll do this again Thank soon. Thank you, Frank. You're the best. Thank you. You really are. Thank, Thank you. you. If you want to comment on any portion of our conversation, you can give me a call, 1-800-848-9222. That's 800-848-9222. This is The Other Side of Midnight. Straight ahead.